Hello everyone, welcome. This is the penultimate uh, reading of the English Cantos Live. Hell Ward, Canto 11, the Poet Asters, Poet Asters. How exactly do you pronounce that word? A very unfamiliar word, a very old word. It goes right back to the 16th century. Ben Johnson wrote a play, play called that. What does it actually mean? It means poets who are not really poets, sadly. In fact, there's far too much of it around today, isn't there? Uh, poetry that isn't really poetry, it's just a political statement. It may be okay as a political statement, but it's not really poetry. And it all kind of begins really with this whole idea that free verse equals political freedom. And this whole meltdown of what a structure of, of a poem is. And so for me as a poet, this is a very, very serious offence. And so we're quite deep down in the wall of hell now we're getting near the bottom and so bad poetry is really got to be punished and so we're going to find some people from America and from people from Britain too in this penultimate canto where we meet the poet Estes. Okay. As Barquo found himself reduced to ash and I looked on astonished by his fate how easily the self-important crash. It seemed there is one whose patience can wait till just that moment when some reach their peak of evil and then destruction looms. Too late. Another way is not there, not what they seek. Too long the training in perversity for souls who love the darkness, Lord the bleak. But I was now somewhere constricting me a cave, an entrance, slanting to a ward, existing lower, with weird symmetry ahead. However, still I had my guard, my master, Dante, whose hands dragged me forth until I saw the cave led to the mad, the truly mad. This ward, full of such worthless individuals, claiming Apollo theirs. And on each other's heads they placed the wreaths of laurel, as pretending they had shares in Daphne's victory, the evergreen Apollo made for true poets to wear. Here, even Dante wearied at the scene, as if the heaven he was in could not protect him from writings, low and obscene. To see such scribbling, such vagaries, blots, more like graffiti than serious works, defacing truth the while their authors gloat, as simians might, whose fingers at nits pick, or primates in their hierarchies might preen themselves, keen on setups for their perks. A sudden howl ahead shook me with fright, as veer the pointless air it blasted through, much as a tunnel is with dynamite. But this was different, and this was new. At least the tunnel had a purpose, led from one obstruction to a better view. But this was pure calamity, and fed on energy that had a darker take, conceived entirely not from soul, but head. Fools thinking Apollo fooled, while they, ego-racked, devised false words to undermine true meaning. There's a license to break rules. Free their snake whose mantra hisses freedom, its scales gleaming. But freedom's far from brotherhoods they preach, and those confusions which their failed explainings never explain, or poetry could reach. For now we came closer to the sound's source, which much resembled a muddy, filthy ditch. So little light and even less remorse as one small man attempted to leap out from the pitch that held him, but, lacking force, his efforts sunk him back while still afloat. He saw me then and howled anew. Hey, you, the weight of the world is love. This isn't rot. Never forget you don't know till you do. Help me escape this awful pit and see, sweet Kaddish, hey, my inner moonlight through. At this Dante moved in front of me and gestured with a sign that seemed to stir the mud. So it rotated at first slowly, as some laxed bit a knackered horse might spur to pick up speed. And as it did, 
the lines within the mud began to form, emerge with their distinctive feature. No design at all. And Ginsberg, excited the while, whooped wildly, hands splayed out. This is all mine! Though speaking, words distorted to a howl. I, I not sure then, did he say mine or mean? Or even was it men? His vowels, foul and slippery, pure outages of his spleen, could not control his consonantal phrasing. Instead of meaning, sound became a stain that blocked the air, insisting on self-praising, as if superb merit inhered in glug, or debasing language was itself pleasing. But Dante, conjuring the ditch, now like a jug, whose contents whirled in the mudstorm that spun, forcing Ginsburg down as water in a plug, I saw those Jimlet eyes knowing their con about to be exposed, his lifeline cut and only endless dirt to bite, chew on. His fear, hysterical as a boil seal shut beneath the skin but bursting to explode, yet downwards forced as Ginsburg surged up one more time, and his works, madness, an ode, now like himself dragged down to where no eye could see such a detour from the right road or plumb its depth. Can madness satisfy? But even as finally he disappeared, with all the counterculture and its lies, where falsehood suffers is no longer cheered by all the rabble worshipping its chip jelly, so at that point another noise I heard. Raphael, my amek is a bi almi, repeated, bellow-like, a stuck refrain. Then seeing one, sized like a redwood tree, gigantic, huge, but captured here in change, which fixed him from waist down into the earth, also held arms, strapped to his heart in pain, as if gainsaid desire to vaunt his worth in words, which now he never would be able to do. Behold, said Dante, Nimrod's curse, the cause of more than war, something too subtle, confusing all the languages of the world, rendering Adam's poetry fitful babble, as now you hear with Ginsburg and his fold. Indeed, you've more to hear before we're done. He paused, I thought a moment, looking old. While Nimrod raged, he murmured to me, Son, I hope to never see these giants more, but for your sake I do. Let's now press on. Which glad I was. The rage at Nimrod's core seemed strong enough to break even his bonds, though forged in heaven, so safely secure. Tell me, I said, as we marched this queer land of strange perspectives, deadening artefacts and Gnostic nonsense no one understood. How is it poets suffer at this depth? Why then this war especially for them below the dross of EU Federalists? First son, he said, be clear. Not from the stem of laurel tended by Apollo do these weeds emerge, infesting all that's clean and wholesome with linguistic dribble spew. Concoctions of venom deep in their souls produce old poisons, though revamped as new. Forgetting holy psalmists and the fool who says in his false heart there is no God, so godless they must go to nothing's hole. When now you see them sinking, though they bob a while, their manic energies consumed, last flickering of ego before it's dropped, and in themselves they're thoroughly entombed. Why? Here's a famous poet wannabe who pilfered laurels on his frantic climb to be America's biggest me, me, me. I looked and saw Wilt Whitless yawping hard with sounds barbaric and untranslatably full, singing self with multitudes of words. How pitiful he seemed, jaw in a lock, 
noise foaming forth as spittle flew like birds in sprays before his mouth which couldn't stop its own inelegance from sounding trash. As Ginsburg sank, so Whitless now was topped by spit, his own reflux turning to ash all verses his deranged mind baptised art. He himself pulverised in dirt's dire crush. Yet like Nimrod, the mastermind and heart of this cruel caprice leading nowhere, so witless in his pride was set apart. Nothing that any said any could bear, though living, citing names for lineage was practice, necessary de rigueur, but each hated the other with furious rage, and more despised true poets writing true, inspired by beauty, goodness, and what sage. Part of their sentence then was hid from view, their splutter, like some hornet taking flight, alighted in their ears and stung them through, right through, to deafen first, then deaden right by piercing up towards their addled brains, so deaf they struggled in their pickled plight the while their own malice surged through their veins. Ultimately, all coherence would be lost, except a tiny soul, bleating, insane, bequeathing, as Whitless did, vapid boasts of self-promotion, impressing no one. For powerless as leaves on water float, so they all struggled, and would still, till done. But Dante, I knew, could barely stand it. Knowing Apollo, the laurels he'd won, though he might and could in one instant split to heaven, I sensed deep discomfiture, so tried to turn him. What about the Brits? American poets, these, damn for sure, but on the other side where England is, do poets there provide the classic cure? Ah, <laughs> Dante then, almost in hysterics, when laughing ceased and he regained himself, his mood changed as by my question oddly fixed. Your poets once upon a time had wealth, for Shakespeare showed the way of form with feeling, such that the muse herself inspired real truth. But now, he indicated where the ceiling of the ward narrowed and space seemed confined, where English poets dealt more damn readings, if that were possible, than Americans bound in all their epic and expansive poses. There was one seated, sighing, a soft sound, who, not in pain, might be as one who dozes quietly in Oxford chambers, dreaming spires, with certain privileges which simply ooze off him, Old world reticence which retires rather than brazen Yankee doodle style. But that would underestimate his fires which burnt as fiercely as any witless wills. And wills the word, for that only accounts for all his rubbish, dry as coffee spills. As not one muse his souls inspires or mounts Parnassus, for only there is sound light. Check. Real musings, not what this one wants. Instead, and nevertheless, to climb the heights, though talentless. Thus he stirred, and I saw a merry gargoyle grimace, its first slight, corrupt his casual face, revealing more. Tell Tony, he said, meaning Blyer, P.M. I really want it. Add it to my score. The laureate ship. No question, his then, on his terms too, as let's do a decade. So block 400 years with new spun phlegm. But wrong before, as now began to fade that pain-free persona he had perfected. And like a rotten wall stripped of its facade, another being emerged, but defective. The blonde Adonis, Tony's blue-eyed chum, who starred with Auden, Larkin, so connected this mummy's boy who knows, who goes, who comes, to whom the English-speaking world presents its prizes in all of London's glittering rooms, now feels his own substance, like skin, absent. Now his soul, roiling as in boiling water, wants proof, some legacy that's cool as cement to hold together pallid nonsense fought for in that 
campaign begun so long ago. Indeed, is he a poet? How be sure? And how be certain he or the world knows? How not, like laureates before, go down, down, down to where chill streams of Lethe flow? Remember hot his collar now and frowns to disfigure that once perfect brow their names? Yes, Austin, Whitehead, Shadwell wore the crown, as Pye, Bridges, Euston, Tate had their time, and not forgetting those we have forgotten, Rowe, Sibber, Macefield, Lewis, such a line, all ones appointed by judgments gone rotten, for whom Apollo never shone or spoke, allowed the true sublime to be begotten. The hell of it, to come round and be woke. That is, to find such papers in his hand, crumbling to pieces from his ego's shock, discovering no one cares or understands one stanza or one line he ever wrote, that poets be oceans, he is a pond. The final proof, poetry no one quotes. And now, Insouciance freezes, alters, a rictus fixed on the river, their notes, how many poets faked it till they faltered to fall in Lethe's stream of nothingness, where in its coldest waste no sound is uttered. I saw his larynx warble, quite muscleless, unable to turn a phrase, describe his torture, though wordsmith once, with words like trots unleashed, but now no words available to soar. And so the dreadful stream flowed on and on, and he, on fire, tipped over for his cure. Imagine it, as Lethe's surface shone with all its frigid, fascinating foam, so handy, like a comet plunged straight down, and as a coal in water hisses steam, so handy was in his monstrous collapse into that flux where beings never be. I heard, alongside the huge hissing, perhaps one other sound, so low, inaudible, except I knew, as one escaping traps feels, and thus sighs, so deep his source of trouble, now whisked away, already cooling, soon no trace beneath the water, not one bubble left to proclaim he'd lived, because he'd gone along with his imposture, poetry too, and I, despite myself, stood there, just stunned. That last sound was what my soul in me knew, and now perhaps as Adam did for Cain, not Abel, felt lost from his endless rue. The wreck of will, the chance to be again. I cried aloud, Sir Handy would not return, his mother's hopes whatever were in vain. All might have been lost, and now of hope shorn. The river's icy grip gave no release, for Judas also could not be reborn. Now Dante tried to comfort, bring me peace. Your tears, my son, misplaced, and do you hurt? Sir Handy had his honour, though but least, like Pharisees praying, but not from their hearts. They had their honours that they sought from men, whilst they ignored him, he, the muses' arts. Compassion elevates the human mean, but pity here is pointless and askew. I longed once more to see Apollo's sun, to see it shine where honeysuckle grew, and turn to find the muses by my side, laughing with joy and prompting me anew, to hear the song that Orpheus strummed and played, not this, not Lethe and its tuneless cold, but still our exit my master delayed pointing as we quit the friendless fold, another edging towards the dark brink, who babbled on about her poetry sold, proudly, first Scot, first woman, and first dyke. It's all big history now with laureateship, and for the people, which is what they like. I wanted to stay, see her verses slip, but Dante reprimanded me. It's gross, he said, enjoying that she writes pure shit. With that, what answer sufficed? At a loss, my contradiction pity lately led, I turned away to be a poet cost. Perhaps here I too 
became as bad. Instead of curses, it was time to bless, for only blessings let poetry be made. Closer she drew to the brink's black abyss, like some white queen who, skipping in her pride, thinks king abandoned, sharp moves win her chess. I tried to help, shout across our divide, but near those waters, even my words died. Thank you for listening in.